everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to hear our visiting Dungeon Scholar. Our speaker tonight has worked in international conflict transformation and humanitarian aid in some form or another for almost 15 years now, in more countries than I probably know, though she specializes in East African studies. She has a bachelor's degree in religious studies from the College of Worcester. Her master's in international peace and conflict resolution comes from American University, and her PhD in the study of religion from the University of London. Currently, she is both an assistant professor and director of peace and justice studies at Pace University in New York. In addition to holding positions as the vice moderator of the World Council of Churches Commission on International Affairs and the main representative of the International Peace Research Association to the United Nations, ad infinitum. In essence, just think impressive. <laughs> Tonight, she'll be talking with us about the role specifically of religion in the conflicts she's experienced and those raging in the world today, so I should probably let her do that. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Welty. so many of your different um, classrooms and in between and after classes. Uh, this is really, for me, the embodiment of what liberal arts education looks like. And so I'm really grateful to all of you to have been with you this week. And I'm really looking forward to being back with you for May term. So this is not the last that you will see of me. I hope that you will, um, if you are interested in what we talk about tonight, you'll consider taking a class with me in May. I'm going to teach a class on humanitarianism and a global global perspective. So often when I tell people that my expertise is in the field of peace and justice with an emphasis on religion, they give me a very particular knowing look. Oh yes, they say, religion has been a source of so much evil in the world. Oh my, they will say, I just simply can't believe what, insert, group that is a religious extremist in the news at the moment, whatever that might be, is doing. So I'm very well aware of the most common prejudice of what everyone assumes that I study. And yes, I know that religion has been responsible for a lot of cruelty, violence, and prejudice. I know that the doctrine of discovery has led to the extermination of indigenous peoples and was supported by religion. I know about the Inquisition, I know about the Holy Wars, I know the way that slavery and apartheid twisted the Bible to support the dehumanization of millions of people. Yes, all of that is true. But religion has also given people the courage to rise up, to challenge systems of domination, to speak truth to power, even at great personal cost. And that is what I'm most interested in, in the resources that religion offers for conflict transformation, peace building, and social justice. And I know that it could be very easy to forget some of the pain and cruelty of the world when you have this beautiful, leafy campus. This town with a great sense of community spirit, with independent bookstores and restaurants. The poverty and the violence of the world might seem far away, and depending on what you read or who you follow on Twitter, depending on what you watch on TV, it might be easy to forget that we have profound food insecurity, devastating inequality, and an increasingly fragile environment. The sense of the university as a place to retreat from the world has a long history. In fact, medieval universities were operated out of monasteries. So the university might be seen as a place to retreat from the world, or as a place to fortify yourself to go forth and set the world on fire. And if it's the former, a place when you have a chance to retreat from the world for four years, my hope for each of you as students is that you don't become so comfortable with the quiet that you forget that the world really needs you. There is work to be done and we actually need everyone to do it. Everyone doesn't need to do the same thing. We need people working on raising the minimum wage, people working to end police brutality, people working on gender justice, climate justice, people working on ending the school to prison pipeline, people working to ban nuclear weapons, and people working on voting rights, and so much, much more. So what does religion have to say about all this? 
When I was an undergraduate student, I started to feel really overwhelmed. At a certain point in my college career, I just felt like anything I could do was actually just going to be this tiny drop when what we needed was actually a flood. So the campus minister intervened, and she gave me a poster with St. Teresa of Avila on it. And it said, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands and feet now but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands which he blesses all the world. I found that really startling. The idea that it wasn't enough for God to just to, for me to pray to God to make change. That God actually needed action from me and from you. As I began to establish myself as both an activist and as a scholar, I continued to concentrate on religion as a framework for peace-building work and transformation. Religious traditions establish ethical norms and moral standards that can direct people's actions and have the power to undergird powerful forms of nonviolent resistance. Indeed, in some societies where political leadership has been corrupted or violently removed from power, it is the religious institutions that have stepped in to fill the gap. But we need to be really clear that also religion is very political. While faith may be primarily expressed privately, there are also political implications for an authentic practice of faith. I think it may be useful, since you've seen this gorgeous poster all over town um, with the word conflict transformation and my name on it, for me to be really clear about what I mean when I say conflict transformation. Conflict transformation is a newer term, and for many of us, it's a term that we prefer over conflict mitigation, conflict management, or even conflict resolution. One of the leading scholars in my field, John Paul Lederach, who in many ways has pioneered our use of this term, describes it in this way. Conflict transformation represents a comprehensive set of lenses for describing how conflict emerges from, evolves within, and brings about changes in the personal, relational, structural, and cultural dimensions, and for developing creative responses that promote peaceful change within those dimensions through nonviolent mechanisms. So what do I mean when I say conflict transformation then? Well, I'm introducing two assumptions into the conversation. One is that conflict is an inherent part of life. We actually can't avoid it even if we wanted to. And two, that we actually need conflict at times to expose systemic injustice. So when we talk about conflict transformation, we're not just talking about ending violent conflict, bringing warring sides to the negotiating table, or engaging in disarmament, uh, demobilization, and reintegration of combatants. We're also talking about structural violence. Violence that may not always take the visible forms of bleeding wounds and bombed out landscapes. The field of peace and justice studies takes the position that racism, homophobia, sexism, transphobia, and xenophobia are also forms of violence. We believe that poverty is a form of violence. And sometimes these forms of structural violence are so embedded in our social, economic, and political systems that they feel like the status quo, or as my students often tell me, that's just the way things are. But from a conflict transformation perspective, we can't be content with the status quo. And sometimes when we begin to speak out about injustice, we're accused of creating conflict. This is why it feels really important to me to keep the words peace and justice together. Without justice, there really can't be peace. So some of what I am going to talk about tonight might surprise you. And it might sound like I'm talking about using religion to stir things up rather than calm things down. And I am. <laughs> Political scientists have often ignored the role of religion in international affairs because they see it as a soft discipline. And activists on their side have often avoided including religion in their work because they associate it with authoritarianism, extremism, or sectarian violence. At the same time, some religious people have been so squeamish about engaging too much in politics, feeling that religion has to be an entirely private matter. But this is not the whole story. One of the basic convictions rooted in religious tradition is the belief that the world can, should, and must be a better place, more peaceful, more just, and that humans are called to participate in this transformation. The Jewish tradition recognizes, recognizes this most eloquently through the idea of tikkun olam, 
the repairer of the world. Rabbi Abraham Heschel talked about the inseparability of tikkun olam and acts of worship. In fact, when he was participating in protests against the war in Vietnam and marching in Selma, Heschel described these experiences as praying with my feet. The prophetic religious traditions are instrumental to peace building and social justice work in their conviction that it is the sacred moral duty of people of conscience to speak truth to power, to name injustice and to challenge the status quo, even when, especially when, it is unpopular. To speak out against homophobia and racism, to challenge sexism, even when you are told you just don't understand how things work, even when you are told you just are not getting what the culture is. Even when you are made to feel stupid or small, even if you are told that this will jeopardize your reputation, your job prospects, your prosperity, yes, even then, and especially then, the prophetic traditions demand that you speak out in defense of vulnerable people. The world's religious traditions are also united in their conviction that the relationship between human beings and the earth must be one of reverence and care for creation. They're unified in their belief that water is precious and that land deserves our loving attention. But even as these traditions challenge us to move outside our comfort zones, they also offer comfort and support for the difficult journey. The notion of the community, the sangha, the uma, the congregation, as communities of both challenge and support are key to the self-understanding of religion. And this community extends beyond the people present with us in this time and place. In fact, one of the gifts of thinking about things in religious terms is that religious communities have often seen the notion of community as extending into the past, as including a lineage of teachers and ancestors, and also extending into the future, a relationship that demands that we act today in the spirit of care for generations that come after us. One of the most pressing questions for those of us engaged in the work of conflict transformation is how to engage in reconciliation and transitional justice in the aftermath of conflict and atrocity. And here too, I think we can see a positive contribution from the world's religious traditions. In the aftermath of the horrors of apartheid in South Africa, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who I think must surely be one of the living saints in our midst, headed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission a radical experiment in transitional justice. After the first exhausting, emotionally shattering day of hearing testimony from survivors, Desmond Tutu, clad in the purple robes of his religious office, publicly wept. This moment of vulnerability, of being present in the midst of pain and yet refusing to give up hope, this gesture of sadness in the midst of a shocking experiment, was one of the most symbolic moments in the TRC process. But if we look at the role of religion in conflict transformation in South Africa, we actually have one of the best case studies of the multiple roles that religious actors can play. Because I think we have to openly acknowledge that the apartheid system was founded on a religious ide ideology, a form of Calvinism, that claimed a special, exceptional, chosen role for white people in South Africa. But at the same time, when the majority of anti-apartheid political leaders were jailed, the religious leaders stepped into the gap and ended up leading the movement to end apartheid. So here's where I enter the story in a small way. The year after I graduated from college, I spent time living in South Africa investigating the role of religion in post-conflict peace building. It was in a time just a few years after apartheid had ended. And the main thing I was doing was interviewing religious leaders on both sides of the conflict about what they were doing during apartheid and how their religious community either supported or contested apartheid. And what I heard was shocking and inspiring um, and confusing at times. I heard stories of people willing to consider forgiveness in the face of unspeakable violence. I heard people use words like mercy in situations that I think most of us could only imagine using the word revenge. I learned a lot about the concept of grace, about refusing vengeance, even when we might deserve it. And I heard clearly that we really can't judge anyone, not even ourselves, by the worst thing that a person ever does. I had the privilege of getting to know a man um, called Archbishop 
Dennis Hurley, who passed away just a few years ago. And he explained his motivation for getting involved in the struggle against apartheid in this way to me. People are created in the image of God, but once you believe that, you actually can't keep quiet. You must speak out, because religion must promote justice. In my time traveling and doing research and humanitarian aid work, I've encountered a lot of religious leaders who've been willing to use their power and privilege to exercise solidarity with vulnerable people. When I was living and working in Uganda, I had the honor of meeting the leaders of the Acholi Religious Leaders Peace Initiative. This group of leaders accompanied children in northern Uganda each night to town centers during the period of time when the Lord's Resistance Army was abducting people into their army. And it was really quite amazing to see some of the most respected religious leaders, Anglican, Catholic, and Muslim, dressed in their full religious regalia, walking with children into public areas and lying down to sleep among them on the ground each night. This drew attention to something that much of the world was ignoring, and the accompaniment represented the embodiment of their faith. Americans have used the same principle of accompaniment inspired by their faith in other conflict zones. For example, the organization Witness for Peace was started to exercise solidarity with the people of Latin America and the Caribbean. The organization was first started as a response to U.S. government funding of Contras, a right-wing Nicaraguan paramilitary group that was funded by the United States that was committing human rights abuses in Nicaragua. Americans began traveling to Nicaragua to witness the effects of guerrilla warfare, returning to the United States and advocating about what they had seen. And this is actually what a lot of my work with the World Council of Churches has looked like. Um, it's been this form of solidarity work. To travel to places like Sri Lanka, Cuba, Myanmar, and China, to speak to people who are living with uncertainty, to be present in desperate places. Not because we know all of the answers, but because sometimes it matters simply to bear witness. The Christian Peacemaker Teams, CPT, have also engaged in this form of accompanying work accompaniment work in Palestine, Iraq, Colombia, and in Canada with indigenous people under threat. Partnering with nonviolent movements around the world, CPT is seeking to embody this inclusive, ecumenical, and diverse community of God's love. Their mission statement describes the impact of religion on their work in this way. We believe that we can transform, transform war and occupation, our own lives, and the wider Christian world through the nonviolent power of God's truth partnership with local peacemakers, and bold action. I spent three weeks with CPT in Hebron and in the occupied West Bank. I'd lived in the region two times before, but this was my first time in Hebron. And one of my primary duties was walking Palestinian elementary school kids to school each day um, in areas that they were under quite a lot of threat from settlers. I found the experience really scary. I'd never been confronted with so much anger towards people who had never met me before and didn't know anything about me. It felt like I was suddenly intervening in something that was way beyond my understanding and that the safest thing to do was definitely going to be to run away, take the first plane back to the safe rural town that I'm from in Michigan, and refuse to watch the news maybe forever. <laughs> to divorce myself entirely from politics. But my faith says something different. My faith says that whatever you believe about the conflict in Israel-Palestine, whatever you feel about occupation and violence is wrong. It's wrong to intimidate children walking to school. And so in the moments that I felt the most afraid, actually like about to throw up afraid, legitimately very afraid, just kept repeating to myself, Christ has no hands and feet in the world but yours. These hands, these feet. These hands, these feet. So using these hands, I reached down and held the hands of the kids that I was escorting to school, and with these feet, I walked. And when I came back to the United States and started talking about my experiences in the West Bank, I had several family friends tell me that I was brave. And while this was a generous compliment, it didn't feel like one that I could accept. I didn't feel brave. In fact, a lot of the time, I felt really scared. But I also felt like it was what was demanded of me in light of my commitments to Christianity. 
that I am very lucky to be born in a time and a place that I can make conscious choices about my faith. I have religious freedom to choose my religious tradition. No one forced me to be a Christian, and I could leave at any point. But when one decides to publicly call oneself a Christian, I think this means willingly accepting that one has taken on more <coughs> duties in the world. And for all of the questions that I have about who Jesus was as a human being, it feels pretty clear to me that he always found the most vulnerable people in his society, and he accompanied them. Now, I want to take a moment here and do a little bit of reflexive thinking with you. Because one of the things I've learned in the last few years of public speaking about religion and conflict transformation is that the audience really prefers it if I talk about the role of religion in other places. <laughs> as long as I talk about South Africa or Cuba or China or Zimbabwe, as long as I talk about other people in other places, everyone is happy. You and I will feel very comfortable with each other. I will tell you stories, and you will choose to feel sorry or inspired or curious. But you won't have to be challenged, because it's not about you. And so as a keynote speaker and someone who is new in your community, I have to tell you it's really tempting to actually do that. It's, it's pretty tempting to keep the focus on other places and not talk about here and not talk about now. But I actually think the authentic practice of faith involves comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. <laughs> so, let's talk about here, let's talk about now, and let's talk just a little bit about religion and conflict transformation when we are looking at our own communities and our own country. Religion is also about rising up, speaking truth to power, and refusing complacency. And action in the street is as important as what happens in the silence in the mosque, the temple, or the church. And as one of my favorite posters declares, if you're not outraged, you're probably not paying attention. Religion calls us to the questions that are the hardest to ask. Asking if the rules, the government, the way things are done around here are consistent with our deepest beliefs about God, the world, and the role of human beings. And so I want to tell you a story about one of the most disruptive things that I felt my faith demanded of me. But first, I think you need to know a little bit of background about my family. My father is a judge. Teaching my siblings and I to weigh the consequences of our actions to decide what is fair and to act with intelligence were core values in my family growing up. And we were taught to have respect for the law. I am, in some ways, hardwired to be a rule follower. I am an oldest child, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, I'm an academic. I like to know what the expectations are so I can meet or exceed them. <laughs> and the one thing I really fear and dread is the idea that someone is disappointed in me. So having the approval of my parents was really important to me throughout high school. But when I got to college, I started to learn all kinds of things that really challenged what I thought I knew. And I started to meet other people who suggested to me that there are times when our faith might mean that we have to break the rules. <coughs> And that's how I ended up being arrested for civil disobedience at a military base in Fort Benning, Georgia. Not because I like breaking the rules, but because I felt bound to a higher set of rules than the ones in place. It was hearing the stories of priests and nuns who had seen firsthand what soldiers trained at the School of the Americas were doing in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. I learned that there was a training camp in the United States that was accepting soldiers and leaders from Latin America and training them in counterinsurgency tactics, including torture and intimidation of civilians. Archbishop Oscar Romero wrote, let us not tire of preaching love. It is the force that will overcome the world. And for me, it was learning that Archbishop Oscar Romero was assassinated in El Salvador while celebrating mass. It was thinking that if his faith could lead him to continue to minister to poor people in the midst of threats against his life, then surely my faith could lead me to demand that the government that I love stop training people to oppress civilians. 
So there was a line on the military base. And a big group of us stood on one side of it with the names of people who had been murdered by graduates of SMU. And we prayed, and we sang, and we held hands, and we crossed the line, and we were arrested, and we were willing to face the punishment. And then I needed to tell my parents. <laughs> How do you tell your parents that you have been arrested? <laughs> to be honest, I am still not sure. <laughs> um, I did tell them. I wanted to be really clear with them that this was not about being provocative. It wasn't about breaking the rules at all. For me, it was a radical rethinking about what it means to love my country and out of that love to want it to do better. It was about believing that the world is meant for good and not evil, that we are hardwired to love and not kill, and that God calls us to use our privilege on behalf of other people, even if it doesn't advance our careers, even if it disappoints our parents. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about 82-year-old Sister Megan Rice, who broke into the Y-12 National Security Complex in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, um, two years ago. She draped a banner saying, never again, um, spray-painted anti-nuclear slogans, and hammered on the building while reading passages from the Bible and singing hymns. And these actions are soundly situated within uh, a group called Plowshares, who have symbolically resisted nuclear weapons by breaking into nuclear facilities nonviolently and spilling their own blood on weapons, and actually beating swords into plowshares using hammers on nuclear warheads. <coughs> She's 85. She regrets nothing. And she describes the basis of her activism in this way. On some questions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? And vanity comes along and asks, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must do it because one's conscience tells one that it is right. Now, as many of you know in the room, I've been working on nuclear issues a lot at the UN and with the World Council of Churches lately. I've done a lot of research. I have written to my senators and Congress members. I have marched, I have held signs, I have made signs, I have even spoken at the United Nations to the United Nations. And I think that the work is not over. And I think that as a person of faith, I have to do something more. And I know that maybe a keynote speaker should seem like she has all of the answers and exude a confidence that makes it seem like I know exactly what I should do here. But in the spirit of openness, I'm simply telling you that I am asking myself if there's a time when I need to engage in civil disobedience again to be heard. If there are moments in history in which the right place for people of conscience is to be in jail. If they are imprisoned for raising awareness about something that threatens humanity. And I honestly don't know the answer to that. I don't know the moment in which you decide that your advocacy is finished and your consciousness raising now involves your own suffering. But this is one of the things I'm really thinking about lately. <coughs> One of the other contributions of religious traditions to conflict transformation and peace building is to take the idea of love seriously. Love is not an irrelevant emotion to religion. In fact, some of the central teachings in all of the major world traditions are to love one's neighbor, love one's community, and love one's God. And the Eastern traditions would add loving kindness towards one's own self to this list. So what then are the political implications of love? This may sound like a strange question for some disciplines. Most of classical economics or political realism is not framed around love. Cesar Chavez argued that nonviolent protest, in his case against the corporate form, corporate farms exploiting migrant labor, required thinking carefully about love of one's enemies. Martin Luther King Jr.'s PhD dissertation focused on how the Christian conception of love had political implications for systems of racist domination in this country. His conviction that everyone, regardless of their human brokenness, regardless of their race, regardless of their racism, 
Everyone was part of the beloved community, but that this membership came with an obligation. While he himself was an ordained minister, King was also deeply dissatisfied with the complacency of the Christian church. His letter from the Birmingham City Jail is largely a condemnation of the well-intentioned white pastors who talked about love on Sunday mornings, standing behind microphones a lot like this one, but who did not do the hard work of working for justice and being faithful allies during the rest of the week. And this is a critique to take seriously right now. We are in a moment in which critical solidarity, our commitment to work for the good of all, matters more than ever. In the words of Ella Baker, until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons, becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's son, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. And in the spirit of the moment we live in right now, I think Miss Ella Baker would add the killing of undocumented people the killing of black women, the killing of transgender people, we who believe in freedom still cannot rest. And for those of us who profess to believe in reconciliation, we cannot speak the words of peace, 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 when there is no justice for many people. Taking religion seriously means taking identity seriously, acknowledging that people are motivated and drawn by beliefs and experiences that are different than our own. The world's religious traditions are also about how we encounter the stranger, how we engage the person who is other. And when we look at our most basic definition of conflict, perceived incompatible goals, we are looking at the encounter between ourselves and our own desires and the desires and goals of a stranger. Religion provides an alternative to a strictly realist interpretation of the world where the logic of politics or economics might say that the world is a zero-sum game and the stranger is suspect. The Realist School of International Relations says it is better to be feared than to be loved. And the neoliberal school of economics claims that everything is a competition and the stranger is the person who wants what you have. Life is a competition. And to all of this, the world's religions say no. The religious paradigm is that divinity comes into the world in the guise of the stranger, whether this be in the Hindu tradition of the avatars of the gods in the world, or Christ's commandment that I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink, I was a stranger and you invited me in. This teaching must reshape the way we respond to the world. If we look at the role of religion in responding to the crisis unfolding with refugees in the Mediterranean, we have to conclude that the active role for people of faith cannot be constructing taller fences to keep people out, but rather inviting the stranger into our space, offering them food when they are hungry, drink when they are thirsty, and shelter. In short, the logic that must drive a religious approach to conflict transformation must be to trust and extend our help to the stranger. And this is not only true in Europe. This is true in this country. This is true in this community. One of the usable frameworks that emerges from religion is also the tradition of confession, of admitting when we get it wrong. It's only quite recently that businesses and nonprofits have realized the wisdom in openly admitting their failures. This wisdom that, that humans often fail to be who we're meant to be has been held by the world's religious tradition for millennia. That we fail when we use violence, we fail when we incarcerate. We have to have humility about what we do in our humanitarian and peacebuilding work. I have probably made a lot of mistakes in my attempts to live out my faith. And that may be true for you too. The Buddhist tradition offers a, a really important piece of wisdom here counseling us to stop, recognize the stories we're telling ourselves, and begin again. So what then can we do? What can you do today to participate in the work of peace building, conflict transformation, and social justice? Yes, it is good to take classes. It is good, of course I think this, I'm a professor. It is good to train, it is good to take my humanitarianism class. <laughs> To take it is good to train in the technical skills necessary to make you as effective and professional as possible. 
It is great to travel, to learn to see the world with new eyes, and to practice being a stranger in a new place. It matters to have a degree, to be a good writer and a critical thinker. But there are also skills based in the wisdom of the world's religions that can help you begin right now, tonight, tomorrow, and next week to train yourself. And tonight we started by talking about spaces very far from you. So I want to end up by talking about you as you are right here and right now. One of the complementary themes between religion and conflict transformation has to do with honoring the inner life. In some ways, my field of peace and justice studies is very focused on action. We care tremendously about praxis, about the impact of theory on actual work in the field. But we also see that our work needs to be guided by contemplation, reflection, and discussion. We see the best work in our field being done by people who are attuned to the life of the mind and who see value in introspection. Contemplative practices like mandalas, labyrinths, seated meditation, yoga, these are practices within religion that have honored the inner life and the deep wisdom that comes from finding the, stop, the still, quiet voice within and honoring your own intuition. So practice being present. Practice being fully present to the world around you, to the people who are right in front of you, to the neighborhood, to the campus. This time is short. This period that you are college students is a short period of time. And yes, the internet is a marvelous place. Technology that can connect us via text to the people we love and the tools we have to find updates in real time via Twitter. That is all actually really valuable. But ultimately, if you want to work in this field, you're gonna to have to put down your phone and be present. If you wanna work in conflict transformation and peace building, you are going to need to learn to cultivate a full, mindful, compassionate presence to the people right in front of you. And this is really hard. I find the draw to my phone, to my laptop, really addictive. And I can justify it in really amazing ways because I am connecting and I am learning and I am checking out what I'm doing. But when I do that, I'm actually also just checking out. I am choosing virtual life over the people in front of me. Philosopher and mathematician Alfred North Whitehead described religion as what we do when we're alone. I'm kind of haunted by that lately especially when I'm thinking about being present and what I do when I'm alone. And I don't think that this is just me, but I start to worry that Candy Crush, and one of my very favorite games, My Clumsy Ninja, that's very amazing, <laughs> um, and NPR podcasts and Snapchat and Instagram, I start to worry that if that's what I do when I'm by myself, that maybe that is related to my religion. And I think that that's a troubling idea. So one of the simplest things you can do if you are interested in joining me in this field is to train yourself to be present in the midst of human suffering, because that is really what we are doing in peace building and development and relief work. If you can learn to find a way to become comfortable with ambiguity and with uncertainty, to practice being present, to train yourself in the art of being alone, in calming yourself in the midst of anxiety, and that will be a gift, not only in the midst of violence or suffering, but if you can learn to do this, to build your own resilience and to safeguard yourself against the trauma of viewing human suffering, you can make a contribution to this field. The other practical skill you can begin to practice now is learning how to be comfortable with conflict. One of the basic distinctions that peace and justice studies makes is between conflict and violence. We think that violence is wrong, destructive, and to be opposed. But we actually see conflict as a good thing. Conflict has the potential for change, and the movement towards social justice is sometimes rooted in creating conflict. People who are living comfortably at the expense of other people are not going to be pleased to be challenged, but you may need to create that conflict. But lucky for you, life provides lots of opportunities to practice conflict. <laughs> And there's actually no need for 
for you to immediately figure out how to participate in the negotiations with Iran when you have very good opportunities to practice conflict transformation in your very own dorm rooms, families, and neighborhoods. So practice listening, really, really listening. Practice asking questions without an agenda. Practice talking about what you are afraid of and what you need, and learn how your body feels when you're having a conflict. Train yourself to be present and calm and engaged in the midst of conflict. And finally, you can call on the religious traditions, particularly whatever your own religious tradition is, to live up to your own values, to actually live out what they profess to believe, to be the hands and feet of the God they claim to serve, and to be the embodiment of the values they so boldly claim. Thank you. all of the time 
I think it's helpful to, to think differently about culture and religion. I like that you separate it in your question, because I think culture and religion are actually different. Um, for me, I think a lot about culture as being the, the invisible, too. It's really easy to think about culture as uh, other people's food, music, movies, art. Um, and that is culture. But I think culture is also um, the invisible and the habits that we have and the uh, routines that we have. And that we, every time we engage with the other, both when we travel, but also here a lot of times. We're engaging in, um, in two different cultures. One of the personal experiences that has really brought that home for me is being married to an English person. Um, I think of myself as being in a cross-cultural marriage. When someone sees um, my spouse and they see another white person who speaks English, they don't necessarily think that we have two different cultures. Uh, but if you've ever engaged in a really heated argument with someone that you love passionately but who just not seem to see the world the way that you do, <laughs> culture feels really evident. And so uh, that daily practice of learning that um, if you tell an American, I mean, one of the, this is okay that I'm telling this story, he has heard me tell this publicly before, but a cultural moment that was really loaded for me and is so minor is one of the first compliments he ever paid me was to tell me he thought I was rather pretty. <laughs> and I was actually kind of, I know I was kind of offended, I was offended. I was like, you can't, can't tell someone they're rather pretty, that sounds like you are, you are medium pretty. <laughs> Um, he felt like he was being really brave and like offering someone a verbal compliment about their beauty and I felt like, no. <laughs> well, I have a follow-up to Kirichi's question because in response to her, you said that you saw religion as something different than culture. Could you expand on that? Yeah, I think religion is probably one of the different forms of culture. So I wouldn't use religion interchangeably with the term culture. I think religion is one of the many things that makes up culture. Um, but I'm, I'm hesitant to use religion and culture interchangeably because a lot of people who would not um, profess any religious tradition most certainly still have culture. So often, uh, religion or religious faith in the face of pressure and conflict can either be abandoned or it can be transformed into sanctified violence, the worst kind of violence that's done in the name of God. So, you know, in your travels and your reading, your conversations, have you had conversations with faith leaders who actively seek? to stop that kind of, of demagoguery, to stop that kind of manipulation, and people across faith traditions who attempt to use sacred texts and practices in order to inspire people to violence. Yeah, um, certainly. I would say immediately after 9-11, that culture existed here most strongly. Um, lots of people naming that religious violence is not, there's nothing religious about it whatsoever. It's a perversion of religion. Um, there were lots of imams in this country who after 9-11 um, formed a variety of different peacemaking groups and were very clear about reclaiming the sense of Islam from this kind of political extremism. Um, it, I would say that's a common theme. Almost every place that I've been, meeting with religious leaders in Sri Lanka a couple of years ago, really clear about the way that a government may mobilize religion may not be the also authentic expression of that religion. And that religion is such a powerful paradigm. Um, if you have a political agenda and you're a government, why wouldn't you manipulate it really? It's, it's politically advantageous for you to do so. And so in, in that moment, the onus is really on religious leaders and ordinary religious people um, to, to put pressure on the religious leaders and, and to say, that is not my faith. Um, and not to, not to hope that someone else will do that for you. I remember seeing an art project here at Mary Baldwin College. Um, they, there 
your reforms that look like crosses kind of twisting and distorting and very disembodied, like what it symbolizes how people twist and turn and distort their religions. You can make a drastically more statement from what is compared to the original holy texts or what it means to be with God and we're speaking about how religion can bring us together with um, understanding Food um, and 
uh, medical care, things like that. Increasingly, that boundary has become blurred for good, I think, um, and has started to look at the root causes of complex emergencies, and so taking development work much more seriously. Uh, the UN is launching the Sustainable Development Goals tomorrow. Um, that is a much wider way of looking at this humanitarianism definition. But that is, that's not how everyone sees it. A lot of people would say it's important to separate humanitarianism um, in a very clear, immediate sense. I look at it as, uh, as peace building and development work in addition to relief work. So I look at a really broad definition. I'm not a huge fan of these binaries of like it's one thing or the other. I'm not sure that looking only at short-term provision of relief is that useful. There's certainly organizations that are better suited to do short-term, but I would argue that we need most organizations to have this longer-term time frame, and then that demands a peace building and development frame as well. Well, to close, I would just add, we've mentioned it several times, that Dr. Wells will be back on our campus teaching a midterm class. Keep that in mind. Thank you for a very rich week here, and thank you for your presentation.